news with the ladies investigating a murder that's a little too close to home at nine o'clock. Did you say I'm your best friend? No. No? No, I don't mean that. Uh, no, 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 no. Fine. I just, you know, I thought you might take a bit long to think about it. No, but uh, am I yours? No. Well, there we are. No, you might have been. If what? If you'd said I was yours. Staged Series 2. All episodes streaming now on BBC iPlayer. I am making some artwork. If you stay like that, it okay. might take a few minutes. Okay. Okay. It so looks like now I might just use it as my passport photo. Interior <laughs> Design Masters with Alan Carr. Coming soon to BBC Two and iPlayer. BBC Newsline with Joe Scott follows the national news stories now on BBC One Northern Ireland with Michelle Hussein. The public are urged to follow lockdown rules as hospital admissions continue to rise. Ministers are not ruling out further restrictions amid concern about whether enough people are complying. We can all do something to help, which is to stay at home, because every, every time you try to flex the rules, that could be fatal. In some areas, temporary morgues are being set up to cope with the high numbers of COVID deaths. With hopes pinned on vaccinations, there's a new promise. Every UK adult will be offered the jab by the autumn. Also tonight, as Democrats in Washington push for President Trump to be impeached, where with his supporters in Arizona. They're hoping he stays in or returns to office despite the violent scenes at the Capitol. Disruption to supermarket supplies in Northern Ireland as food shipments from Great Britain become more complex after Brexit. And an FA Cup upset as Leeds United are defeated by Crawley Town. The Health Secretary Matt Hancock has warned that flexing lockdown rules could be fatal, urging everyone to adhere to restrictions aimed at bringing coronavirus infections under control. As hospitals continue to be under intense pressure, there is concern about public compliance with the rules. The Labour leader, Sakir Starmer, says the current ones may not be tough enough. Our first report is from our political correspondent, Ian Watson. Central London on a Sunday. Shops usually open, now shuttered. Streets eerily quiet. Government ministers say the early signs are more people are complying with this lockdown than the last one in England in November. But the data also shows that in some parts of the country, more people are on the move than during the first lockdown in March. So the government is making its message even more stark. Careless actions cost lives. The government rules only are one part of this. What really matters is what every single person does, because that's how the virus spreads. We can all do something to help, which is to stay at home, because every every time you try to flex the rules, that could be fatal. Okay, yeah. okay we're going to go all over on three. One, two, three. So is this the consequence of flexing the rules? The scenes in University College Hospital in London show the huge pressure the NHS is under in battling a new variant of the virus. And scientists who advise the government say that what may be needed isn't simply more compliance, but more restrictions. Whether the current restrictions are enough, uh, I think it remains to be seen. It will be a, a week or two before it becomes clear. Uh, they may be sufficient, but, but uh, we have to be very vigilant. And if there's any sign that they're not, then we're going to have to be even stricter, I'm afraid. The view from Downing Street is that the current measures are pretty harsh and they'd much rather encourage people to follow the rules rather than impose new restrictions. They say that in any case their options are quite limited. But the path of this pandemic has forced politicians to change course before. And a man who wants to occupy number 10 Downing Street says that the current restrictions may have to be tightened. They may not be tough enough, but in a sense, I think the most important thing is for people to get that message about stay at home. 
The Labour leader says he now wants to summon the spirit of the first lockdown in March. Parliament agreed then to close some things which remain open now. So what would tougher restrictions look like? Well, I think there's a case for looking at nursery schools. We're talking to the scientists about it, but I think quite a lot of people are surprised that primary schools are closed and that nurseries that aren't closed. That like a probably, yes. I think they probably should be closed. Tonight at Westminster, the streets are calm, but activity in government is frantic. In the coming days, the medics and scientists, not just the politicians, will be telling us that following the rules will save lives. Ian Watson, BBC News. One of the highest infection areas, uh, infection areas for infection rates in the country is in Surrey, where every hospital mortuary is now full and almost 200 bodies are being stored in a temporary morgue. Other local authorities have told the BBC they expect to open similar facilities soon. Our home editor Mark Easton and cameraman James Anderson were given access to the emergency Surrey site, located at a former military hospital. This is the cold conclusion of a pandemic out of control. An emergency body storage facility has been assembled in Woodland in Surrey. With hospital mortuaries almost overflowing, the county's dead are brought here. 20 more body bags unloaded today. To respect the dignity and sensitivities of the dead and their families, we're not showing the bodies, but I can tell you that in this fridge, there are around 50 body bags among 170 bodies currently stored here. These racks are expected to be full in just a few days. Around half the body bags stored here are marked COVID positive. Surrey now has one of the highest infection rates in the country. The numbers have increased dramatically and rapidly um, over the last two and a half weeks. You know, and that is causing us some concern. Um, and at present, there's no sign of that actually diminishing either. The message from from the guidance and from government is really clear, and I think we should be doing our, our utmost to, to uphold that. And this facility is sort of testament of, of where I think we're actually failing to do that at present. Fire and police officers have been drafted in to help, some brought back from retirement. Until recently, Kirsty was a detective on Surrey's murder squad. It's been a dreadful year for everyone. However, working here, I can see that the numbers are increasing, not decreasing. And I would hate, for the sake of people staying indoors rather than going out and meeting people, that their loved ones or they themselves were to end up here. That's exactly what we don't want. Surrey is struggling to cope with a raging pandemic that shows little sign of abating. Health officials worry the current restrictions are simply not enough to turn the tide. This lockdown doesn't look or feel like the one last spring. Some are urging the government to introduce a curfew, but the Prime Minister's understood to regard that idea as unworkable and un-British. Just asking people whether they think the public's taking this lockdown seriously enough. I think there are shops open that aren't essential, and also previously you couldn't have cleaners in your house and... Um are the tradesmen which you are now so I don't think this lockdown is a strict I think people have got complacent over it thinking it won't happen to me and they're just going about things as normal and like nothing's different there are 845 spaces at Surrey's emergency body storage facility some fear that may not be enough Mark Easton BBC News Surrey all the latest government figures show that there were 54,940 new coronavirus infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period. That means the average number of new cases per day in the last week is now 59,853. Hospitals have had an average of 29,630 COVID-19 inpatients. Another 563 deaths have been recorded of people who died within 28 days of a positive COVID test. It's the first time in four days that figure has been below 1,000, but the numbers at the weekend are often lower because of delays in collecting the data. On average, there were 909 deaths announced every day in the last week. The total number of UK deaths is now 81,431. 
today, the health secretary promised that by the autumn, every adult in the UK will have been offered a coronavirus vaccination. In England, new NHS centres are opening from tomorrow. In London, Bristol, Manchester, Stevenage, Surrey, Birmingham and Newcastle. Our health correspondent Dominic Hughes has the details. This is our best hope of escaping the yeah. coronavirus pandemic. Mass vaccination on a scale the country has never seen before. At this centre in Stevenage, local NHS staff are among the first to receive the jab. Everybody's been struggling. Um, we, you know, you, ne you never know whether you're going into work and what you're finding. That's where people so by having dark. this, we just know that we can start to, to, to work together and build and really make a difference in, in terms of everyone that's out there and hopefully get out of this pandemic that we're in. I'm happy and excited that I got it because I know I'll be um, protecting not only myself but the people I work with. As well as the centre in Stevenage, this one in Manchester and five other hubs will start offering vaccinations this week. It marks a big acceleration in the vaccination programme and it's needed if the government's going to hit its mid-February target of offering the jab to 15 million people, including some of the most vulnerable and health and care workers. In Scotland, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine will be more widely available through a 1,000 GP practices and centres. Wales and Northern Ireland have each administered more than 70,000 vaccines. Long-term ambitions go further. An announcement this morning that all over 18s could receive the jab by autumn. But that seems a long way away, while a combination of soaring hospital admissions and staff sickness is creating a crisis that is entering uncharted territory. We're seeing uh, hospitals having to divert patients because they're too full, and that's having a knock-on effect on other hospitals who then also become uh, too full. Uh, and uh, we're concerned that this will be a situation that could spread to other parts uh, of the country. So um, the situation is quite desperate. In a bid to break the transmission chain of the virus, this week we'll also see the start in England of regular rapid lateral flow testing for people who can't work from home. The tests deliver results in 30 minutes and aim to identify people who aren't showing any symptoms but that's unlikely to ease the pressures the health service faces right now and will over the weeks to come dominic hughes bbc news and professor chris whitty the chief medical officer of england will be on bbc breakfast and on the today program tomorrow morning and he'll also be taking audience questions on five live and the bbc news channel at half past eight now, it's emerged that building owners are being asked to sign a gagging clause when they apply to a government fund for the removal of dangerous cladding. Part of the contract they're asked to sign requires them not to communicate with journalists without government permission. Campaigners say that there should be scrutiny where the government says agreements are standard commercial ones. Well, our Home Affairs correspondent Tom Simons has been looking into this and is here now. The campaigners sound pretty unhappy, Tom. They're very unhappy. Yeah, this is for applications to a government fund, a £1.6 billion pound fund set up to speed up the removal of that dangerous cladding. And the applications are from building owners and sometimes uh, building managers, including residents who, who run their own buildings. Uh, and what the contract says is that any contact with the media should be agreed with a government press office and that that would only happen if there is overwhelming public interest. Now, as you say, the government says this is a standard commercial agreement, but this is not really a very standard commercial situation. Uh, there's been a lot of distrust that's grown up since the Grenfell Tower fire. People are living in dangerous buildings. They're paying vast amounts of money for uh, for waking watches to make sure there isn't a fire to be, to be warned, uh, insurance premiums. Many of them can't move and get away from all of this. And there are lots of questions about the fund and where the money is going to go to. Uh, journalists like me are scrutinising the government on this pretty much every day. So this contract might make it more difficult. And the UK Cladding Action Group says that no government should be hiding behind a non-disclosure agreement and it wants to get rid of what it's calling these gagging clauses. Tom, thank you very much. Shoppers in Northern Ireland have been facing bare shelves at some supermarkets since the 1st of January following the UK's trade separation from the EU after Brexit. The new arrangements now mean that it's become more complicated for businesses to ship food over the Irish Sea from Britain and some lorry loads have faced delays. Here's our Ireland correspondent Emma Vardy.
January may be the time some of us want to consume a little less, but shoppers in Northern Ireland have found the shelves noticeably bare. I was in Tesco and there was lots of empty shelves today. Uh, I was mostly the frozen food as well. I was looking for like fish and stuff and I was wondering why there was no food. There is very little vegetables in that store and uh, pure orange juice is completely wiped out. Sainsbury's, Tesco's and Asda have all said some products have faced hold-ups or are in limited supply due to the new post-Brexit rules. M&S, meanwhile, has taken precautionary measures after seeing competitors' lorries delayed at ports. Marks and Spencers has temporarily withdrawn more than 300 products from sale in Northern Ireland. It's about 5% of what you'd normally see in its stores while it gets to grips with the new paperwork. It includes more specialist items like sushi and some cheeses. Since the 1st of January, food crossing from Britain to Northern Ireland has needed new paperwork and checks because Northern Ireland has remained within the EU single market while the rest of the UK has left. It means that an entire lorry load can be held up at ports like Belfast, even if only one item on board doesn't have the correct customs declarations filled out. I've got a lot of examples this week where even some of the bigger supermarkets haven't been prepared for the additional paperwork. But that, that's only part of the issue. In addition to that, a lot of companies are aware of the additional requirements and have made a business decision to cease supply in Northern Ireland in the short term until all the teething issues uh, are sorted out. Supermarkets say they will get the full range of products back up for sale as they adapt to the new arrangements. But because of some stockpiling over Christmas, freight will only begin to return to normal volumes next week. And the government's warning the most difficult period is yet to come. We're working with supermarkets in order to ensure that Northern Ireland consumers can have an uninterrupted supply of the products that they're used to enjoy. We said that there would be some initial disruption. We're ironing it out, but the situation will get worse before it gets better. Agreeing the special arrangements for Northern Ireland was always one of the most contentious parts of the Brexit process. And for now at least, the reality of introducing a new trade border within the UK is becoming plain to see. Emma Vardy, BBC News, Belfast. Officials in Indonesia say they've located the black box flight recorders from the Boeing 737 airliner that crashed yesterday. 62 passengers and crew were on board the jet, which disappeared from radar screens over the sea four minutes after taking off from the capital, Jakarta. There appears to be no hope of finding survivors. Democrats in the U.S. House of Representatives say they will start impeachment proceedings against President Trump this week after accusing him of inciting his supporters to storm the Capitol building. That followed an effort by Mr. Trump over many weeks to overturn November's election results. It repeatedly failed in the courts. We'll get more from our Washington correspondent in just a moment. First, Sophie Long reports from Arizona, where many of the president's backers are downplaying Wednesday's violence and continue to believe that the polls were rigged. Dear Lord, we ask that you watch over our president. His family, they come to pray for their president, Donald J. Trump, and demand that their rights be restored. They will never break our will. Amen. These supporters of Donald Trump don't recognize the result of what they believe was a stolen election, and they say they'll continue their fight to prove that. I think there's only one thing that will happen that will stop these is when Trump becomes president again. Will you continue to come down here after Joe Biden is inaugurated? on the 20th of January. Uh, Joe Biden will not be inaugurated on the 20th of January. So I don't feel any need. I'll keep coming here until Trump is back in office. These scenes in the nation's capital shocked America and the world. People watched a protest called by the president turn into a riot that resulted in destruction and loss of life. But one of the most high-profile protesters leading the charge called it a beautiful day. Jake Angeli spoke to me just hours before he was arrested and detained by the FBI. My intention was to do whatever it is that my country needed me to do without fear. I had no idea that I was going to end up in the Senate, uh, on the Senate floor and sitting in Mike Pence's chair. But the moment that I had the opportunity, I most certainly took it. 
at Sammy's Mexican Grill, where Donald Trump's supporters meet and eat, what they say they saw on the 6th was a peaceful march that was infiltrated by violent members of the far left. Somebody prepared everything. It's act, everybody acting. Do you think the president was set up to look bad? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. There's no it question about that. that. Who, would, who would set up the president to look bad? Democrats. Democrats? Of course. And I truly believe that a lot of the people that were there were probably Antifa and many of the other people that have gone to these various things and tried to create havoc. I think it's probably some other group, because if you look at the rallies he had, there was never any violence in the rallies. And like Marie said, with the Antifa and all of that, I think they were traveling around the country causing trouble. Joe Biden is due to be inaugurated in less than two weeks. In fact, fervent supporters still flying the flag for Donald Trump are far from ready to face. Sophie Long, BBC News, Phoenix. From that, let's turn to events in Washington. Our correspondent, Lebu Diseko, is there. Where have the Democrats got to in their effort to impeach President Trump, Lebu? Well, there are now around 210 Democrats that are backing the article of impeachment. Uh, that is very close to the threshold they need to impeach. And a senior Democrat saying today that a vote could come as early as Wednesday, maybe even before. But when it comes to the next stage in this process, that is the trial in the Senate, the same senior Democrats saying that they could wait as long as 100 days. The reason being that gives Joe Biden time to confirm his cabinet something that wouldn't be possible if the Senate is busy with a trial. Now, history suggests that there is precedent and that it is possible to impeach a president that has left office. Uh, and if that did happen, Donald Trump would be only the, would be the first president to be impeached twice in his lifetime. Deborah Diseko, Washington correspondent, thank you very much. Time now to catch up on the sport. Ollie Foster's at the BBC uh, Sports Centre. Hello, Ollie. Thank you, Michelle. The FA Cup third round continued today. There are some terrific goals coming up after the news, but there are a couple for you now if you can't wait that long. Non-league Marines' dreams have been dashed by Tottenham, but there was still a big upset today as Crawley Town from League Two knocked out Leeds United. Here's our sports correspondent, Andy Swiss. Under cold grey skies, a day when Crawley lit up the cup. 62 league places separated them from Leeds United, but you'd have struggled to guess it. Oh, what a goal. Crawley ahead. Nick Cirilla's first ever goal in senior football. He'll do well to score a better one. That, though, was just a start, as moments later, Ashley Nadison made it too. Yes, it was a goalkeeping howler, but Crawley's manager wasn't complaining. And for their fans at home, it was soon pinch yourself time. 3 0 to League 2, Crawley. Jordan Tunnicliffe sealing a stunning victory. Rarely has a shock seemed quite so straightforward. But if that was an upset, it was nothing to the one Marine were hoping for. Cheered on from neighbouring houses, the part timers faced Tottenham, and for 20 minutes, they dared to dream. Oh, he's had a go. What a good go. Trainee plumber Neil Kegney agonisingly close. They couldn't, could they? Well, the gulf of 161 league places did eventually tell. A first half hat trick from Carlos Vinicius before 16 year old Alfie Devine became Spurs' youngest ever goal scorer. But despite losing 5 0, this was Marine's night, the fondest of cup farewells. Andy Swiss, BBC News. Rangers are 22 points clear at the top of the Scottish Premiership after winning 2-1 at Aberdeen. Alfredo Morelos scored both their goals either side of half-time. Celtic are a distant second in the table but do have four games in hand. After a raft of Covid positives and injuries across the Women's Super League, only one game went ahead this weekend. That was at Reading this afternoon, where champions Chelsea ran out 5-0 winners. The England striker Fran Kirby scored four of their goals as they moved up to second in the table behind Manchester United. The third test in Sydney was stopped for 10 minutes on day four after India alleged that a section of Australian supporters had racially abused one of their players. Six fans were ejected by police. India had also lodged a formal complaint yesterday after another incident. Australia are on top in the match as they look to go 2-1 up in the series. 
That was a great result for the British skier Dave Riding at the latest World Cup event in Switzerland. He took bronze in the slalom. He was down in eighth after his first run, but the 34-year-old made it onto the podium for only the third time in his career at a World Cup. Of course, there's a lot more on the BBC Sport website, all those FA Cup goals, and also news that next month's Women's Six Nations Championship is expected to be delayed until April. Michelle. Oli, thank you very much. And that's it from us on BBC One. Time now for the news wherever you are. Good night.